Good evening, everyone. So good to see you all come in here to the room tonight. Uh, my name is Anna Christensen, and I am the head administrator for the Institute of Holistic Nutrition for the in-class and online Eastern Division time zones. And so thank you for joining us tonight here for uh, Paul's webinar on, we've got on clinical detoxification, where he is going to take the mystery out of detoxification for you. So let me introduce Paul to you. Paul has empowered people to consciously and holistically manage their health for close to 20 years. Paul holds a diploma in Applied Holistic Nutrition from the Institute of Holistic Nutrition and a Certificate of Achievement in the Teacher Trainer of Adults Program at Centennial College. He is dedicated to investigating, clarifying, and explaining important nutrition issues and concepts. He is an ardent proponent of critical thinking in the context of health and published research. Paul taught in the core diploma program at the Institute of Holistic Nutrition for 17 years. Currently, he works full-time between his work as the program facilitator at the International Society for Orthomolecular Medicine, that's ISOM, and running his private clinical nutrition practice. Paul is driven to increase awareness at the foundational role of nutrients play in mental health. He teaches nutrition and mental health and clinical detoxification in the continuing edu education department at IHN. So Paul, tell us a little bit about your work at ISOM to, with relating to Dr. Abram Hoffer's original book on schizophrenia. Take it away. Right. So uh, one of the projects I was uh, tasked with was to update Abram Hoffer's uh, original book on schizophrenia, which basically documented his uh, experiences run are with mental health and then schizophrenia running a uh, one of the biggest schizophrenia hospitals in Saskatoon and then as uh, yeah, basically he documented pretty much everything he did and why his, his nutrients that he used and then uh, so many many years went by and it was time to update the book so my role was to take his original book and then integrate uh, supporting evidence for what he was doing back then, and then new uh, research and new findings and new things that would be useful. And also we uh, pulled in uh, some chapters from uh, Dr. James Greenblatt, who's one of the world experts on uh, mental health, and Dr. Jonathan Prowski, who's a naturopath who works a lot with mental health and helping people get off their meds, so both experts in, in their field as well. And so the job was to weave all that together into a cohesive uh, book that kind of did the timeline through Abram Hoffer's uh, lifetime and then updated with good current info. And it's quite interesting to see a book you write show up on Amazon and consistently sell month after month after That's month. That's amazing. That sounds so fascinating and interesting. What a what a journey for you on that. Wow. So I will let you take it away. You go for it. And I will get your questions, everyone, at the end of the webinar. Great. Well, thank you. I'm just going to start by saying I'm happy to be here today talk about detoxification because I think it's absolutely critical that everybody understand this. Um, you know, the world is not getting any cleaner. Uh, it's only going the other way. And so if I can share a little bit on detoxification so people can understand how it works and do it in the proper way, then that makes me happy. Um, you know, if it weren't for detoxification, I know I would not be here today, I wouldn't be alive. I uh, had a very bad, dark time in my life. It was about 30 years ago, and I got multiple chemical sensitivities. And that is where you, you're extremely sensitive to all chemicals in the environment. And, you know, it started with not liking perfumes, uh, thinking they were smelling bad and then they actually made me sick and then as time went by I progressed you know laundry detergents and then dishwashing liquids and it got worse and worse and worse uh, smoke cigarette smoke car exhaust um, just walking outside and uh, over 10 years I studied toxins and I learned all about them 
and but I just kept getting worse and worse. It, it, in the last year, I ended up, I had a clean room in my basement and I was shunned by my family for the most part because I couldn't go anywhere, couldn't eat anything, couldn't be out in public because those chemicals are absolutely everywhere. And uh, so things got really bad. I got depressed. Looking back, I probably but it's probably pretty bad depression. I didn't know at the time, brain fog all the time, migraines all the time. And it was terrible. And uh, you know, I remember waking up one morning and going, you know what, I think I'll be dead in two months. There's no place to go. And as things happened, the very next day, a friend uh, told me about this kid who went to a detox clinic in Halifax and he had chemical sensitivities and he was there for a month or so. And when he came back, he was much better. And to this day, I don't know why it never occurred to me to look at detox over those 10 years, but suddenly I was looking at detox and I started to do some things and started to notice a difference. And so I did a lot of research. And one of the things I found is you have to support detox and do it properly. Otherwise you can make yourself really sick. So I decided I would go talk to my doctor and my doctor was a, uh, she was a holistic minded medical doctor and uh, she worked with a holistic minded naturopath. And so between the two of them, I did detox after detox, after detox, after detox for six months. But at the end of the six months, I was completely better. So 10 years of getting worse and worse and worse and worse completely turned around in six months and that was pretty powerful for me that started my deep passion for uh, detoxification and learning everything about it so that's how I got into this um, I teach detox because I think it is very important for uh, to know this stuff but be also be able to teach it um, and hand it over to clients or family members in a way that they will uh, be able to use it uh, accept it first and then use it. And so what I teach in the program or with clients um, or other things that I do is based on those many, 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 many detoxes I did. The uh, about 20 years of researching detox now, uh, thousands and thousands of articles, books, other sources of information that I just like pour over, uh, many, many, many presentations by um, orthomolecular functional medicine doctors presenting on how they do detox and why they do it that way. And then, you know, lastly, actually running hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of detoxes with clients over the last 15 to 20 years. So you know, it's quite a, a volume of context for me to um, kind of draw on. And so what I do is organize this stuff and present it in a way that is actually useful. So today I'm going to be sharing the information I think is most useful and most important. So information and concepts to kind of get you started on thinking about detoxification in a good way. I'm going to share my slides now and they should be up. So here we go. How to improve your life or improve your life by reducing toxins in your home and body. Uh, and that's really where it starts. Um, the bulk of our toxic load comes from inside the house. Um, and a lot of it's generated inside the body as well. And so first, you got to talk about skeptics. Because anybody who you want to give a detox to is going to go, well, I read this and I read they're dangerous. Or this doctor, my doctor says that you know, shouldn't do a detox and they don't work and all that stuff. So the skeptics are out there and people are exposed to what they say. Um, I should tell you that many, 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 many people who write negatively about health issues are specifically paid to do just that. So keep that in mind. So let's look at skeptics. This is a uh, website called uh, Science Based Medicine. And, uh, you know, here we go, the detox scam, how to spot it and how to avoid it. Um, so there's lots of things that we can deconstruct there uh, with that uh oh dr what's his face dr Roz got in there and uh, some of our favorite detox things are in there as well um you can always tell people who are paid or just nuts i'll just do it that way um by the way they talk see the detox scam could you imagine if you said said something about oh the uh 
a certain medicine scam and how to spot it um, wouldn't fly, but it flies in the realm of putting down things that are good for you. So we're told often, you know, there's no such thing as toxins. We don't accumulate. And uh, so therefore, there's no need for detoxification. Just going to show you a few things. This has got to be like the hallmark of good stories to tell when people don't believe in detoxification or that we're toxic. And this was a uh, study that was done by the Environmental Working Group. Uh, I think it was 2009, 2005. And what they did was they drew umbilical cord blood, umbilical cord blood from 10 um, women's umbilical cords across the United States all on the same day. And uh, so basically what happened is this is what they found. So they took the blood and they sent it off for analysis and they found uh, 287 chemicals in the umbilical cord blood. So remember, this is what the baby was developing in right? So already exposed to toxin. 217 of those were known, uh, or 180 were known to cause cancer, and 217 are brain toxins, and 208 cause birth defects or abnormal, abnormal development uh, when you look at animal tests, but no reason they wouldn't do the same in humans. So now the question is, if it's already there, when the child is born, how can we not be toxic and how can there be no such thing as toxins? If you do a Google search, I did this one recently um, and the term was PubMed, which is the repository for um, pretty much published resource, uh, research on all kinds of things, but here we go. And you look for environmental toxins, we get 25,700,000 results for environmental toxins. If they didn't exist, I would expect that number to be much lower. So they do exist. When I talk about it, when I teach about it, we just go through the list of documentation, just the proof. So there's absolutely no doubt. Um, then the next thing is toxins, you know, well, we're exposing them, but they don't cause illness because it's so low amounts and the body can deal with it anyway. Another PubMed search, environmental toxins, the same one, but look at these articles, uh, impact of pesticides, physical and social and emotional impact of environmental toxins, allergy and inflammation, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, pregnancy loss, and the list goes on for another 200,000 or so. Um, and so there's quite a bit of evidence that this is real, even if you don't even go into the articles, you can see uh, this is a just some more examples, environmental mercury and the toxic effects that goes on and on about that. And there are plenty of toxic effects in mercury. Epigenetics, so environmental chemicals affect genes and gene transcription. Environmental chemicals have shown to increase the risk of diabetes and obesity by interfering with the way some of the um, gene transcription happens and some of the enzymes work that we need in the body. And uh, this is a short list of things that are associated with toxins. So if we go through this, I'm not going to read the whole list, um, but if you scan through this, this is a pretty comprehensive list of things you might see clients with or family members with. And every single one of those things potentially has a toxin-driven component or is completely driven by toxins. And then the uh, next thing we hear is uh, detoxes don't remove toxins and that uh, they don't work. And, uh, you know, the uh, the detox bashing people love to talk about the foot baths. Uh, the psychology is you always pick an easy target and something that people already think is probably a scam. And then you use that to represent all detoxification. And so, you know, for years, I never uh, really believed in detox baths. It's like, how is this possible? And then I was at a conference and uh, actually saw the studies done and the information presented so I can safely say that some detox foot baths actually do work and they do work quite well. Um, more bashing of detoxification. You can't detox your body. It's a myth. So how do you get healthy? Um, you notice that's a declarative statement and um, that's the other way you can identify these things. They just declare something to be true, but they never back it up. There's no, oh, this study showed this and this study showed that. They just make the statements and you have to believe it, much of the way a government medicine is working in over the last two years as well. 
Here's another one. Detox scams are worthless and potentially dangerous. Notice the psychology here. Yes, detox scams are worthless. Scams are worthless, but that is meant to read as detoxification is worthless or all detoxes are scams. And so, you know, so annoying. And uh, down here we got, this is your liver. It does a good job of detoxing you. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, this is your kidneys. They do a good job of detoxing you. Yeah, that's good. Uh, this is food. I don't care how much organic quinoa you put in. You will never, it will never detox you. Well, eating organic de uh, quinoa is not a detox. And so basically they are just talking about nonsense. Could you imagine if you did that? I don't care how much Prozac you take. It will never fix your broken leg you'd be shot down in like minutes. So here's some proof that the detoxes do work, uh, effects of a short-term detoxification in disease-free individuals. And so these are people who don't have diseases. They ran them through a seven-day pro detox program, and they found by testing a 23% increase in liver detoxification capacity um, measured by caffeine clearance, which is a standard measure of detoxification. Also increased the urinary sulfate to creatine ratio, uh, ratio, which is sign of improved liver function. So detoxification works. And then the last one here um, is detoxes can be harmful. And so going back to PubMed and looking for articles that detoxes are harmful, there's 14 results. Uh, but last time I checked, 11 of those were about detoxing from your cell phone, not about detoxing with body chemistry and environmental toxins, but cell phones. So this number should really read about three. If we're going to compare that to medications, it's like 32 and a half thousand hits for medication can be harmful. And so it's like, who are these people to tell us that detoxes are harmful when their own tools are way more harmful. And uh, here's another one uh, that I uh, tracked down. Uh, detoxification is dangerous, 178 results. Here's the top two hits. Interestingly, they reveal some, um, some, some good knowledge here. So to the best of our knowledge, no randomized controlled trials have been conducted to assess the effectiveness of commercial detox diets in humans. So they're sure it doesn't work but there has never been any studies on it. And the second article basically says there is no internationally valid guideline concerning administration of activated charcoal. Hang on a second. Somehow the kids know when Paul's on a Zoom call, it's time to start screaming. Right, so you will hear over and over again that activated charcoal is dangerous and it doesn't do anything and there's no standards on how to use it or, or inter internationally accepted ones or whether it's safe or not. Um, but guess what they use in a hospital if somebody comes in with drug poisoning and it's still in the GI tract, they use activated charcoal. So then the last thing we can we talk about is the body is fully capable of eliminating toxins that we're exposed to. You hear that over and over again. And it's kind of true, but it's kind of not true. Um, they say we don't need to do anything to support detoxification. And so what this does is it ignores chronic low-level exposures that never go away. Um, it also ignores what these exposures are. So things that did not exist when our detox systems were created. So way back when, 20, 30,000 years ago, no heavy metals, no pesticides, herbicides, chemicals, exhaust, mold, toxins, chronic stress, which is also known to cause problems with talk detoxification. We didn't have nutrient-free food. We didn't have toxin-rich food. We didn't have a diet that was staples with sugar and starch. We didn't have these genetic polymorphisms tied to detoxification, which generally come from this and this. And we didn't have food that was 40 to 60% uh, of the less nutrients in them. So basically, it's not the same world that the detox system was designed for. Uh, here's a study that basically are the results of a study that showed that uh, the uh, mineral content of fruits and vegetables has dropped uh, quite dramatically between 1940 and 1991 and has continued to drop since then. Some of the things that are really important, like magnesium, were only around 25% of what or they've dropped by 25%. And look at zinc, which is absolutely vital for detoxification, has dropped down 
by 60%. So that exists. And detoxification, as I'm going to talk about coming up, is nutrient. Uh, it's a nutrient required process. It's a very a nutrient in, intensive process. Without nutrients, you can't detox. And so this shows a percent of the U.S. population with intakes below the E. A R estimated average requirement, um, which is not the. This is the amount that keeps you barely healthy. It's not the amount to deal with any chronic issues or anything like that. And so this is the um, amount of people who have less than what they need. So for vitamin D, look, it's like uh, about ninety-two or three percent vitamin E, uh, quite high. So these people, not only it's not the food, but it is not in their bodies either. This is a nice article I found uh, just by random. I was looking something up and uh, it was written by a, I think it's a medical doctor and it said detoxing hypocrisy. And uh, so he's sick and tired of this hypocrisy of medicine versus um, non-medicine guys. And so this is from his website and uh, it goes, the medical community mocks all forms of detoxing practiced within the alternative health community. They mock all the things we talk about, but he goes, but make no mistake, the medical community absolutely understands the principles behind detoxing and encourages people to practice their recommended versions of it. And those versions are the ones that are under the guidance of a physician with the aid of pharmaceutical drugs. So in other words, detox is bad if you do it, detox is good if we do it, but how many doctors are trained in doing detoxification properly? Not many. So this is the part where I need to tell everybody that published research ain't what it's cracked up to be. And so this is an article in the BMJ, so British Medical Journal, uh, clinical trials are not the be all and end all. And evidence-based medicine is based on the wrong evidence. So medicine loves to use this um, because you get the, the study sizes to be proper are very large and very expensive, which means the only people who can afford to do them are the medical side. So then the nutritional side can't do them. They go, well, you have no research there. But remember the randomized control trials and the uh, when they do the meta-analysis of all of these can only show correlation and not causation. So they never prove anything substantially, they just give hints. And then they give hints about what would work. And so they're not the be all and end all, you can definitely learn stuff from them, but they should never be treated as gospel truth. Here's a article in plus one why most re published research findings are false. And uh, if you read this article, I mean, it's very technical. Um, I can't believe it actually got published. But it basically shows that the way medicine or medical research is done now, it uh, can basically get the numbers you want for whatever you want. And that's that. Uh, here's an article that came up um, through uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Alec Vasquez. And uh, I'm a big fan of his. He's a uh, genius when it comes to uh, nutrition and medicine. And so he uh, did a breakdown of a uh, a study that showed that uh, high dose zinc doesn't help in COVID-19. And uh, so there's lots of ways to lie with published research. So here we go, JAMA. So this was in JAMA. They lied about their dosing by stating that 50 milligrams of zinc, zinc gluconate is high dose, when in fact it provides only seven milligrams of elemental zinc, which is not therapeutic in any way, shape or form. And so Basically, they can say, oh, this is high dose, and it wasn't. So seven milligrams is nothing. And so they run the study. They use seven milligrams, and they go, see, no results for zinc. Zinc is terrible. Don't even use it. So published research, you have to know what they looked at, what they did, and then you have to say, do I believe this or should I believe this? Okay, so that covers what do you say when somebody says detoxification is bad, doesn't work, or not effective, and all that kind of stuff. Let's get into why or how detoxification works. 
And uh, so it goes like this. I'm going to use a simple model. It's going to get a little more complex, but here we go. The T stands for toxins. So toxins floating around the blood and they come to the liver. And then we're going to say this is a liver cell. And so the little gear there tells you the liver is going to do some work on it. So the toxin comes in and what it does is the liver cell will then act on that. It will do a chemical reaction on the toxin. If it's water soluble, it'll send it back into the blood. So water-soluble toxins come in, they get acted on, they go into the blood, and in the process, we generate a free radical, and the free radical is damaging to the liver cells. So in order to do this stage, we need vitamins and minerals. We need vitamins and minerals for the enzymes that do the work. Uh, we need it to make the antioxidants to protect the liver cells. We need protein to make the actual uh, enzymes, and then we need external um, antioxidants as well to support and protect those liver cells. If the toxin is fat soluble, it can't go this route because fat and water don't mix. So something has to happen to that toxin. So the toxin gets metabolized and there's an enzyme tra transaction that happens to it. And so basically what happens is the toxin is it made more reactive. So that's why it's in red, because now it's more toxic. It's more toxic than when it came in. But the body does that so that it can pass it over to another set of enzymes that will then stick something to it to make the toxin water soluble so we can get rid of it. And so the things we stick to it are called conjugates. And the main conjugates are glutathione, glycine, uh, methyl groups, sulfur, acetyl-CoA, and glucuronic acid. So we're going to stick one of those onto the toxin. And when we do that, the toxin gets combined with the conjugate there, and then we can dispose of it by putting it in the blood and urine or the water-soluble site, or we put it in bile. And once it's in the bile, it goes into the GI tract, and then it gets eliminated. And so Detoxification is nutrient intensive. Take a look at this list of everything that's required to properly and safely detox. So to do all of this properly, we need a lot of things. We need vitamins and minerals, we need the protein, we need antioxidants, the vitamin A, C and E, glutathione for antioxidant, but you know, glutathione is an antioxidant. So the main antioxidant that the body makes, but it's also the main conjugate that we stick toxins to as well. We got CoQ10, we got superoxide dismutase as uh, um, antioxidants, we got all the conjugates. And then, you know, for glutathione, which is very important, we need the nutrients to make that. So the body needs to use all these guys vitamin C, NAC, alpha-lipoic acid, glycine, glutamic acid, B6, folate, 12, selenium, and zinc. So lots and lots and lots of nutrients required for detoxification. So if we have a detox capacity that matches our detox load or that needs processing, then things go good. So toxins in, the liver is able to effectively deal with all of them, then the toxins go out in a safe way. If we have more toxins coming in, then we have liver capacity. So let's say the liver capacity stayed the same, but now we have more toxins, then we will still detox a portion of it. But then some of those toxins are going to go right back into the blood in their toxic form, their more reactive form. If we have a normal amount of toxic load and our capacity to detox drops, then we're going to detox some things but we're still going to generate a lot of toxins to go back in the blood. So not very good. And so what happens when we have too many toxins going back in, they, well, take a look, the fat soluble toxins go into fat cells in the liver, the brain, nervous system, bones and marrow. And so they will drop in there and they will reside in those cells. And the water soluble ones will go into the blood, they're going to the tissues, the muscles and the joints and cause problems there. So what we want to do is instead of having a poor capacity to handle detoxification and generate toxic um, byproducts, we want to have a normal toxic load plus excess capacity for detoxification so that we can not only de detox what we normally come in, but other toxins as well, things we might be dumping from the tissues. So 
there's your basic primer on how it works. How do we do a detox? Well, I love to find things and then just tear them apart. Let's go through this. This was in uh, healthline.com and most common ways to detox. And so most detoxes, according to this article, will include this. So let's go through it. Fasting for one to three days. Uh, that is avoiding food. It's not detoxifying which you'll see why in a second. Well, for starters, where's all those nutrients? Uh, drinking fresh fruit and vegetables, smoothies, water, and tea. Yeah, you know, that'll support detox, but it's not detoxification. Drinking only specific liquids like salted water or lemon juice. That's not detoxification either. That is just drinking salted water and lemon juice. Uh, eliminating foods high in heavy metals, contaminants, allergens. That is not detoxification. That is just removing some of the load. So maybe a little beneficial, but it's not detox. Uh, taking supplements or herbs. Yes, those can support detoxification and then upregulate it. So I like that one. Avoiding allergenic foods and slowly reintroducing them. That's not a detox. That's an allergy testing protocol. Um, it could help if you're toxic, but it's not detoxification, using laxative colon cleansers or enemas, they support detoxification, but they're not really detox. And then exercising, very beneficial, especially if you're doing a detox, but it's not detox itself. Completely eliminating sugar, coffee, cigarettes, and refined sugar, or alcohol, um, that's not detox detoxification either, but it is reducing the load. Um, so it is supportive of detox. Uh, here's a funny question, though. Why would a health-oriented website like Healthline be promoting plant-based protein foods? Anyway, just kind of shows you where their bias is coming from. Okay, so cleanses and fasting. So if you do lots of water and liquids as your fa uh, cleanse and fast, uh, you take a lot of the bad stuff out from the diet, uh, increase your plant content, uh, that can go good or bad. But if you do it wrong, you will not have enough of the supporting nutrients you need or the binders, and that ends up with this. So here we go. This is inadequate nutrition may often be explained away as a healing crisis or bad detoxification process. And then detoxification reactions and other physiological changes associated with healing certainly do occur, but they must be differentiated from adverse reactions arising from nutritionally inadequate diets. So yes, healing crises do exist. They, but a lot of times when they happen, when somebody's doing a detox, it's not because a healing crisis, it's because they did not have the nutrients they needed to do it properly, nor the binders they needed to do it properly. And so the healing crisis becomes the scapegoat. So if you do cleansing and fasting properly, it's potentially safe and very effective. So I'm going to go through the three stages of detoxification. This is from an article on my website. Uh, you can read it there uh, in detail. I'm just going to kind of talk you through it. Um, and uh, I, when I do lectures on detoxification, this is how I explain it. There's three stages. Um, so here we have a muddy river coming in to a pond, or uh, yeah, we'll just call it a pond. And so there's muddy river or muddy water in the pond, and then there's accumulated toxins and mud at the bottom of the pond. So there's three stages that need to be addressed when you're doing detoxification. So the first step is to decrease the incoming toxins. I like to quote Dr. Thomas Levy when he says, you can't dry off in the shower. You have to get out of the shower if you wanna dry off. And the same thing goes for toxins. You have to reduce the load if you wanna detoxify. And so what are the main uh, toxins we're uh, exposed to? Sugar, wheat, gluten, dairy, like these are no brainers. Uh, they're just bad foods. Coffee. Uh, there's a lot of debate about coffee. I am a big fan of coffee for detoxification if it's organic and it doesn't have sugar in it and it doesn't have conventional cream or milk in it. Um, it was interesting, Dr. Prezorno, who is now one of the world experts on detoxification, last time I heard him speak, he said, you know, I'm 50-50 on whether you should avoid or strategically use coffee and detoxification. Uh, I'm not 50-50. I uh, will look at the person for sure. And uh, 
I typically say, yes, keep your coffee, but keep it clean. So, but you go to Tim's or go to any conventional coffee place that's loaded with pesticides, molds, and all that other stuff. So definitely do not want that when you're doing a detox. You want to keep the alcohol down, largely because the liver has to detoxify alcohol. And so you're already using it for that. You're not going to be able to use it for detoxification. Uh, processed foods, which are full of garbage, um, non-organic foods. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that coming up. Um, if you want to know about reducing that toxic load of foods, it's uh, EWG, which stands for environmentalworkinggroup.org. When you look up their dirty dozen and clean 15 list, this is the dirty dozen list the last time I looked. And so these, we got their 12 foods. Yeah. Um, if you switch to organic for those 12 foods, you will reduce roughly 80% of your incoming toxic load. So, you know, every bit counts and you don't have to be 100% organic to do good work. But these ones, 50% um, or 80% of the load comes from there. So it's a no brainer to take those things out. Uh, the things that I tell my clients right off the bat is carrots and potatoes you have to take out. Carrots and potatoes are what are used by when a farmer goes from a conventional to organic, the plant carrots and potatoes to draw out the poisons, the toxins out of the soil. So they're very good at that. So we shouldn't eat them. Uh, Non-organic non eggs, dairy or meat, um, all contain high amounts of um, toxins, farmed fish, and then large fish, which accumulate up the, the uh, food chain. And then uh, other things, additives, artificial flavors, color, artificial sweeteners, you know, none of these things are real food. None of these things are molecules the body has ever been exposed to or would use. And so there's only one route for them, and that is detoxification. Uh, and keep in mind, all of these are there for the benefit of the manufacturer, not the people consuming them. These are some shots I did of the way most people poison themselves, you know, what kind of nutrient value is in that foods and what kind of toxic load is in the foods? Do you think there's more toxins than nutrients? Um, I hope so, because there is. Uh, other ways we get toxins, uh, cooking and storing, aluminum, Teflon, plastic, they're all known to leach toxins into the food. And so a lot of things people do every day uh, just brings more and more toxins in. You know, the safe ones are good quality stainless steel, good quality glass, and uh, ceramic cookware. And then uh, personal products like toothpaste, uh, soaps, deodorants, fragrances, lipsticks, all of these are full of chemicals if you don't buy them from you know, health food stores and things like that. This is where uh, women get most of their toxic load um, and then men for some degree for some of this stuff. I just didn't go down that aisle. And then things for no apparent reason, air fresheners. You know, since when does a clean room have a smell or clean clothes have a smell? If they've got a smell, they can't be clean by definition. Uh, the scented candles, the Environmental Protection Agency, 30 years ago said there is absolutely nothing more toxic you can bring into your home than scented candles. They are designed to distribute those toxic uh, camp compounds that are in the fragrances into the air, into your lungs, and into your brain and your livers. And so it just goes on and on and on. Um, the fabrics we use, the paints, the glues, the vinyl, you know, vinyl out gases for at least 10 years, carpeting also 10 years, laminate uh, flooring, good quality, high compressed flooring is actually pretty good, but most of the stuff is toxic, just outgasses forever. Pressure treated wood is high in cadmium and mercury. And then we get the pesticides. And so the key toxins that we worry about, heavy metals like lead, cadmium, and mercury, aluminum, bromide. We got the pesticides, the things that act like hormone mim uh, mimickers, things that are sensitizers. So sensitizers, what they do, these are chemicals that are used for whatever reason, but they... When they get to the liver and other detox organs, they, the load that they put on decreases the capacity of those tissues to function. And so they sensitize the body to become more and more um, sensitive to those, to other um, toxins. Now, this is a shot glass that I picked up at the airport uh, in California and LA many, many years ago when I was down there for a, a, a workshop. 
and uh, so I had some time to kill. So I went in there and it's like, this was like seven bucks us. And it's like, yeah, who would pay for that? Who would pay that much money for a simple shot glass? And then I flipped open and looked at the bottom and there's a statement in California. They have it's proposition 42 uh, was passed a long time ago that said, if you knowingly or unlo- if you, don't disclose a toxin in whatever your product is to the public and they sue you, they will win. And the law, I don't know if it still does it, but at the time said you could even sue the directors of corporations. And so everything in California has got these labels all over it. And this one said, warning, this product contains cadmium and cadmium lead, Toxins known to the state of California to cause you know, cancer and birth defects. And it's like seven bucks US, I got to have this. And so I brought it home and I've been teaching with it ever since. By the way, what's the difference between this shot glass and one you might buy downtown in a tourist shop? Um, this one has a label on it and the other ones don't. This is a uh, elephant that I bought. My dad uh, used to collect elephants or we started giving him elephants for his birthday and Christmas and stuff. He started a collection. And so I was at the dollar store and they go, Oh, there's an elephant. And so I picked it up and I go, wow, this is really heavy. And uh, so this was about two weeks after the dollar stores opened. I don't know if you remember way back, it's probably about 10 years ago now that health Canada did a big uh, publicity stunt and they shut down all the, the, uh, dollar stores across Canada and they, because they said they found lead in children's toys. And so they were not going to open them up until all the lead was gone. And so they went through and they got rid of all the lead. Three weeks later, I'm in the dollar store. I find this elephant that's really heavy. I take it over to the pen section and, you know, they have a little piece of paper so you can test the pens out. And I use the trunk and I write perfectly with it. And I go, this thing is probably 95 to hundred percent lead. This is after Health Canada apparently went through and got rid of all the lead. So these heavy metals and things, they just shouldn't be there. And, you know, we're being protected. Not a chance. Okay, so you got to stop the toxic load coming in. Second part is you got to support body detoxification. And you can do that with foods. I'm just going to quickly go through this. You need good quality protein. Meat. You need or you can use legumes and beans for the fiber, but also the protein few other things in there, methyl donators, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage. They also, uh, what they do is they upregulate detoxification in a good way. So they kind of downregulate phase one and upregulate phase two so that we have a balance um, and we don't overproduce the intermediates. Uh, Oranges, tangerines, and citrus peels kind of work the same way. They upregulate detoxification. Same for dill and caraway. Uh, Ground flaxseed is an excellent binder of toxins. Not everybody can do it, but they can. It's a a good tool. Uh, Dark leafy greens uh, provide methyl groups and uh, some minerals and things like that. Uh, Turmeric is good because it upregulates detoxification in a good safe way. It's also anti-inflammatory and in the detoxification of heavy metals and pesticides is inherently inflammatory process. Uh, Supplements that uh, are I would say vital for detoxification, vitamin C, and in high amounts, like in the six grams and higher range, Uh, vitamin E, N-acetylcysteine to make the glutathione. N-acetylcysteine is also an antioxidant in its own right, and it's also a toxin, uh, antitoxin molecule as N-acetylcysteine. Alpha-lipoic acid, also the same thing, you need for glutathione and has detoxification properties on its own. Uh, B-complex vitamins are needed for a lot of things as cofactors and the enzymes that do detoxification, but they're also required to make ATP because all the cells in the body need ATP for energy and the liver uses high amounts of ATP to do detoxification. Uh, we got fish oils. Uh, they do upregulate one of the pathways for uh, detoxification, but they're also anti-inflammatory. And then milk thistle is a known agent for upregulating detoxification capacity and rate. And it's also known to help regenerate damaged liver tissue. So other support for detoxification, um, I always use a high quality multivitamin or multimineral, uh, green drinks and powders, uh, not for everybody, but I do do them. Uh, probiotics, oops, sorry, 
probiotics, uh, they help detoxify toxins in the gut, either on the way in when you're eating the food or after they've been tox- uh, detoxified and dumped in the gut, because sometimes they can get unconjugated. And so the probiotics help there. They also turn uh, or prevent the for mercury, for example, the conversion of methyl mercury into the or the uh, regular mercury into the methyl version, which is very, very toxic. Uh, binders, uh, I would never do a detox, even if somebody wanted to say that master cleanse, which I would never do, but um, I would never do that without binders because if you are going to dump toxins into your gut and you don't have binders there to bind them up, they will go back into the bloodstream and they'll go back in a more toxic form than they were when they were sitting in the tissues. And so the last thing to talk about is the deeper detoxification, getting rid of the sludge on the bottom, the acquired, accumulated toxic load. And so you uh, want to provide all the nutrients needed for that detox. So that massive chart I showed on that one slide there, you want to upregulate detox enzymes. So you want to make them work faster and more effectively. You want to increase the bile flow because we dump the toxins into bile. And if we don't generate a lot of bile, then those toxins will stay in the liver cells and cause damage. Uh, you want to keep that digestive tract moving so whatever you put in goes all the way through and gets out. You want to bind the toxins in the gut. You want to upregulate kidney function and you want to support the lymphatic system because it's going to be taking the toxins that you dump out of your tissues and bones and things to the liver. And let's talk a little bit about some what we actually do. So Actions, uh, kits and supplements for that deeper detoxification. So there's detox powders that you can get and use, uh, specialized supplements that are for detoxification and uh, herbal kits for detoxification as well. And so these are the ones I recommend uh, quite often. Uh, They're all very similar in that they are powders or powdered formulations of vitamins and minerals nutrients that upregulate uh, liver capacity and do protection for us and binders. And so this is, I believe this is the uh, Detoxiclens uh, product list. And so I'm just going to go through and show that we have protein in there because you need to make the enzymes. We have antioxidants to protect the liver cells as they do detoxification. Uh, They do the conjugation and the actions on it. There's the B vitamins for energy and for cofactors. There's the methyl donators for cofactors for the enzymes, but also to uh, to act as conjugates. There's minerals. Uh, The calcium is in there to uh, when you dump out cadmium and mercury from your tissues, they go into the blood and they circulate for a while, and then they could re- um, deposit back into the tissues. So putting calcium in, which is an agonist for the uh, heavy metals, um, helps protect against th- uh, that happening. And uh, yeah, we got phosphorus, it works pretty much the same way. We got zinc for making um, the detoxification enzymes, selenium, the same thing as well, but both of those are required to make glutathione on top of that. Um, Zinc is also required to make stomach acid and digestive enzymes, so to help reduce the load of toxins we generate inside. Molybdenum is required for uh, detoxification. Without that molecule, one of the pathways doesn't work. Escape me which one it is right now, but one of them absolutely requires molybdenum. Uh, there's a bunch of fibers to act as uh, binders. We have that glutamine, glycine. These uh, help to make uh, glutathione, uh, alginates, and chlorellas to act as binders for heavy metals and pesticide residues and uh, mycotoxins. Um, we have a whole list of the glutathione promoting uh, supplements. There's a little stevia in there to make it taste okay. Uh, MSM for the methyl groups and the sulfur groups, and alpha-lipoic acid for. Uh, um, making glutathione. Got, there's some milk thistle, there's some bro- uh, broccoli, and then the glucurate for making glucuronic acid. Um, and in this form, it helps prevent unconjugation of molecules after they've been dumped in their gut. It's especially useful for preventing the unconjugation of estrogen. So when you look at this, you see everything that the liver could possibly want to do or need to do detoxification safely. 
Uh, this is another formula from uh, Douglas Labs, and it's pretty much the same thing, so I'm not going to go through this, but um, the idea is the same. Provide everything required for detoxification. Uh, some of the herbal kits, uh, basically, they upregulate detoxification, they upregulate bile, they upregulate digestive motility. They might provide some nutrients, but they do not have the total package of nutrients that the liver needs uh, to do the job. So, you know, I have done lots of, you know, after I did my detoxes, and then I got into the nutrition, then I got into nutrition school, I started testing out detoxes, and I did many, 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 many of them. And all the herbal ones made me sick until I had to add in high dose vitamin C and a few other nutrients, and then they were okay. And so basically, you got the upregulating part, you make everything work faster part you need, here's the tools for those processes to work, you need to have those added. Uh, further support for detoxification, uh, you want to limit food intake, so less uh, food going in, less uh, food uh, nutrients and other compounds going into the blood, less that the liver has to deal with. Sauna helps move toxins out through the skin. Uh, juicing can help provide uh, nutrients, but um, it's more for upregulating detoxification from my perspective. Uh, coffee enemas, you know, how come coffee is bad, but coffee enemas are good? Uh, coffee enemas work by upregulating glutathione production. And here's a tip, coffee does it as well. Um, maybe not as directly because when you do coffee's enema, it goes right into the lymphatic system and dumps right into the liver. So it's more of a direct, uh, less caffeine, detoxified. Uh, colonics help clear out toxic residue and move things along. Um, if people do fasts, uh, in my opinion, anything over three days, they must do colonics. Otherwise, they're just increasing toxins. So a few things to keep in mind when uh, detoxing. So digestion always has to be working well. When clients come to see me, we do not touch detoxification until I'm satisfied digestion is working properly. Um, if you're constipated, don't do it. Uh, I had a client come in who uh, was working with a naturopath, came to see me because everything got worse. I said, what, let me see the supplements, three detox formulas, and she was constipated. There was no binders. There was nothing to, no magnesium, nothing to address the constipation. So basically, she's just pulling her toxins out, and they were just staying in the gut and then being reabsorbed in a more toxic uh, state. Uh, definitely drink lots of water. Um, make sure you get enough fiber. Um, you can supplement fiber if you need it, if it's not in the diet. Um, support a neutral pH, so with veggies and fruit. Um, it does, you know, the less acids that are generated in the body, the more effectively the kidneys can work on the acids that are generated from detoxification. Uh, extra vitamin C, this is a no-brainer. Vitamin C, vitamin C, vitamin C. Um, I wouldn't do any less than six grams a day on somebody who is uh, detoxing, and we've gone up to 18 to 20. Um, detox only when emotionally, logistically ready. Yes, detoxification. If you're going to do a, uh, say, a protocol that has steps in it and it lasts a certain amount of time, you must be mentally ready for it. Um, just going, okay, now's the time. So when I give out detoxes, I go, here's the detox for when you're ready. Don't start today. Just start in a couple of days. You'll know when you're ready. Start it. Send me an email when you start. Um, and logistically, you don't do a detox when you don't have all your ingredients. And you don't do a detox in the middle of when you know you got a wedding in the middle of, say, the two weeks of your detox, because you're just going to make everybody at the wedding unhappy. Uh, don't detox if you're sick or stressed. The body's already got its hands full. Uh, so other things, um, if people get serious reactions when they're detoxing, um, that means they're not being supported enough. So you can decrease what you're doing. So if you did, say, a thousand milligrams of something, you could take it down to 250 or 500. Um, so you decrease what you're doing or you, you can decrease it and do it for longer. That's not a problem. Or you just discontinue for a while and then kind of assess what's going on. Uh, most people actually feel a decrease in energy the first couple of days and then an increase in energy and an overall sense of well-being. It's like, it's crazy, but uh, it's good. It's what I do in practice. So ensure good digestion, address leaky gut. If you suspect leaky gut, you got to do the digestive healing formula. You got to uh, 
uh, fix that up. Otherwise, the toxins that are coming in are actually have even better access to get back in the bloodstream. And if you got leaky gut, remember, leaky gut equals leaky blood brain barrier. So the toxins you pull out will have direct access to the brain. So leaky gut's got to be addressed. Uh, build a nutrient status. Sometimes I go two months, three months before we do a detox because people are so nutrient deficient. Um, if you can address emotional imbalances, can't always do that, but sometimes depending on what your training is and what you're comfortable with, you can do that. Um, general, I usually start with a detox kit, like one of the four I showed you uh, with the, the powders. Um, and then based on the individual, we might do a lymphatic protocol. So the increased lymphatic, lymphatic uh, output, but also flow rate and uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. A heavy metal detox uh, is always after the general detoxes. Hang on, I just dropped something. And uh, then homeopathic detox remedies. Homeopath homeopathics get a bad rap. They say they don't work. Uh, I can tell you they worked because after I did my six months of detoxification, my uh, doctor uh, suggested I do a homeopathic remedy for a month. And I said, sure. And the instructions were start with one drop three times a day in a glass of water. And I said, what have I got left to detox after uh, um, six months of detoxification? I'll just do the, the full dosing of five drops three times a day. Yeah, I was so sick the next three days because I was dumping stuff. So it went in at another level to pull out toxins. So yes, that's another step we do. And then there's other measures um, that I do. And then repeat this as needed. So when I did my six months, it was essentially this cycle. So starting with the uh, the general, we did all this first, then we did this, and we did this, and we did this, and then we did this, and then we did it again. So, and again, and again. So, because you're not going to get all the toxins out of somebody in one round. It is impossible. Uh, it's also dangerous, right? So you want to gradually, systematically reduce the toxic load. So recap here, um, if you want to detox, you got to get out of the shower first, stop that incoming, support the natural detox. So support what the liver does every day because we're detoxing 24 seven and then go further by upregulating detoxification. So that's what I have on that. If you want to know more about that and more about what I do, this is my website. I actually haven't updated it in about 15 years because I've been too busy teaching and working and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, but this stuff will get uh, the articles and recipes tab will give you some good articles. I have one on detox. I have a, one on mental health. It's a good one. And I have one that uh, it's called Do Vitamins Kill People? And it's a, I break down a study that, looked at using vitamin um, vitamins in a lot of people over years and it proved that uh, vitamins actually make people worse, except the study didn't say that. They said it was marginally uh, better. Um, but when the news media got on it, they said it kills people. But it's good to understand what happens to research. Um, so that's a good article to read. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm starting uh, at IHN, the uh, clinical detoxifications, uh, seven classes, um, starts uh, September 7th. We have to skip one of the classes on the 28th because I'm away for a medical conference. Um, but uh, seven classes, 6.30 to 9.30. And uh, we're going to go through very, we're going to go through in very much detail all the toxins that people are exposed to. Um, and what to do about them because the toxins are here. If you don't know about them, you won't be able to flag them when you're doing an intake with people. It won't go, oh, this is caused by lead or this is caused by cadmium or that's caused by, uh, you know, the uh, you've been walking out in your, uh, your deck, this pressure treated wood and bare feet. So you need to know what the enemy is first. And then we're gonna talk about the process of detoxification in detail because you know, a lot of people go, how do I detoxify the COVID vaccine? And it's like, well, I don't know. Nobody knows. Um, but I know how detox works. What would make sense in the, under, with the understanding of how detoxification works and knowing what is in the vaccine, what would make sense? So when you take a course like this, it's kind of like teaching a man to fish so you can 
be fed for life as opposed to giving them a fish. So you understand detoxification. You can go, what am I going to do in this context and why? And uh, then we're going to go through a lot of protocols, um, some of mine, uh, a lot of protocols that orthomolecular and functional medicine doctors do. So we're going to break them down so you understand what they're doing and why. And so ultimately, at the end of this, you can end up feeling confident in doing detoxes with people. And you're going to you're gonna have enough to go, this is what I feel comfortable with, and this is what I'm going to implement. And then you're not going to go too far, and you're not going to hurt people, and you know, you're going to actually help people. So that's basically that course. And if you're interested, you can contact the school. And I believe we're going to get more info on that in a second. And so that wraps up my talk for today. I hope you got some good info. Okay. Paul, that was so interesting. I thank you. Like that was, that was really great. I love the, uh, all that. Sorry, my, my lights are not that great right now. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I really enjoyed the uh, how you had all the research articles at the beginning. Like you did a lot of your own work for for the presentation and showing us all those articles and the things they say. And and it was great to have your your feedback on that. I I really enjoyed that. And that that uh, work that uh, Con Ed course sounds really interesting. Every time I do one of these webinars, I always want to do the workshop. That <laughs> <laughs> that comes afterwards. So that was excellent. So yeah, we'll take some questions now. Now we do have someone that raised their hand. And so I'm going to see where are they? Uh, okay, that maybe they took it down. I think it was a mirror. Okay, if you want to speak, let me know and I will allow you to talk. Otherwise, we'll get to a question. So um so someone's asking, will the lecture be available to review after tonight? Absolutely. Um, and we have Kevin who's asking, does washing fruit and vegetables with baking soda get rid of most pesticides? Well, that was interesting. I don't know if it gets rid of most pesticides, but it is one strategy. Um, <clears throat> trying to remember who it was. I think it's Dr. Pizzorno said that uh, he cracks vitamin C into the water when he does his veggies and also uh, veggie wash, like washes that are specifically uh, used for vegetables are effective. So um, it depends, I switch around. Uh, you know what veggie wash is? The, it's soap, but it's a soap that washes off cleanly in cold water. Mm, that's like, it's with glycerin, isn't it? I think the veggie washes. Yeah, there uh, could be one of the ingredients anyway. Yeah. yeah, but that's it. So soap is actually very effective. And but remember, we're still just dealing with the surface layer. But yeah, yeah. I've seen bicarbonate. I think that's one of the ones Pizarro re recommends as well. So uh, the washes, the vitamin C, and uh, the uh, bicarbonate. Excellent. Um, okay, we have Carrie who's asking potatoes and carrots question. Did you recommend to not eat them at all or eat organic only? What about quality? Oh, yeah, we'll start with that when she has a second one. We'll follow okay. up. Okay, so definitely organic. Yep. Um, you know, except if you're potatoes, you should never do massive amounts of any anyway, but because of the starch, right? But, you know, potatoes have been around for a long time. They're in diets. And um, so if you're going to do them, and I recommend everybody do them only organic. But, you know, good health is not what you do all the time. It's what you do most of the time. Yeah. What we really want to do, like a, a truly healthy person has resiliency to take hits, right? Because if you go back 30,000 years, a lot of things came back or a lot of things came up that were very hard on the person. And it was the resiliency that got them through. And so mm -hmm. we want that resiliency. And so, yeah. So if I go to a restaurant and they have potatoes and I want them, I will do them. But that is very far in between. Right? So there was a point, though, in, in the presentation, you said potatoes and carrots not to eat them. Right. Wasn't that it? Because you're saying that they pull the toxins. Right. So you're saying if we eat them like we're pulling in more toxins right. to the body. But wouldn't we poop them out, too? Yeah, but not after they have gotten into the bloodstream. Ah, uh, okay. 
So what you're saying is generally keep the potatoes and carrots down to a minimum. Uh, what I'm saying is generally keep the non-organic down to okay. very rarely. Okay. All right. So the second question is, what about quality peanuts? I've heard they often get mold. Right. So if it's moldy, it's not quality. <laughs> um, so I'm actually a fan of peanuts, but only organic. Okay. I mean, it has to be from a source that you trust um, just because of the mold issue. For sure. Okay. Someone said, uh, wow. Marie said, wow. Thousands of thanks. Incredibly interesting. Really was. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then Carrie asking, um, can you talk about the detox baths? Which products are best to use and how often would you do them? Yeah, I don't really use them. Um, it was in 2019. I was in San Diego at a medical conference and one of the vendors there had the detox, um, baths there on display, but they also had their literature published. And it boils down to the nature of the particles because the particles have to be ionic, which means they have to have a charge. And so the charge means as the blood flows through the bottom of the feet, I suspect on the top as well, uh, the, the minerals that are in that or the heavy metals that are in that blood are going to be attracted to that charge and go through the skin. And we know that toxins go through the skin. That's why we do the sweating, right? So um, I don't have any specific products anymore. Um, they're always changing. I would look for products that have published research behind them. So I don't know of any Canadian companies. I know there's one in the U.S. because I saw them. So, yeah. Um, but that said, I mean, that is assist detox. It basically assists bringing the load down. It's not detoxification per se, because detoxification happens in the liver. And so I would much rather spend the money on upregulating the liver and giving it the nutrients it needs and the binders and things than spending money on a detox bath. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause those baths, that's where it comes out. All that dark stuff. That's the, that's the, when you see that you think, Oh, I'm detoxing. Right. But is that like, what is that? That dark, is that, is that actually detoxing out of the body? I've never done one. Yeah. So the, the ones that have validated research, they would measure that water, right? That's what you want to look for. And so they can tell what actually came out. And so those ones show that, yes, we did have heavy metals in there. We had pesticide residue mm. and things like that. So you actually are pulling things out. So, okay. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Kevin is asking, is there a recommended amount of time to send, uh, to spend in a steam sauna? The answer is it depends. So yeah, the one reason I teach all the background for detoxification is because there are no two identical people, uh, which is another article on my website that's called you're different. And I listed one day after just getting tired of trying to explain all the different ways where people were different, I just wrote them all down. And so that is a good resource to have on hand because it shows you all the things you have to consider when you're working with somebody. And so, you know, a lot of people go, I would give me the detox protocol. And I go, there is no that detox protocol. Yeah. There is a detox protocol in that person who is sitting in front of you. Now, a lot of times you can use off the shelf products as part of what you do, but, when do you start doing it? Like, do they have, you know, I'll tell you one thing. If somebody's a, a risk for suicide, you would never, ever do a detox on them, not even the foot baths, because you don't want to change biochemistry. You don't want to change mental chemistry. And you wouldn't even do a, uh, you know, the basic powders, which I consider the first easy step, because you have to build a nutrient. So if they got mental health problems, they got nutrient deficiencies. So you have to start there. So every person is unique. Every person's uh, condition is going to be unique. So you have to like kind of know your tools and pick the one or use them in the order and durations that uh, you decide is going to work. But that said, um, some people who are heavy toxic can't last more than 30 seconds in a sauna, period, because heavy metals have dysregulated the thermal controls in the brain. But they can work up to an hour 
Um, that's been documented. Um, so it depends on the person and there are measures like heart rate, things like that. So uh, um, that you use as indicators of, is it time to come out? Yeah. Um, but you always start low, um, short duration, and then you increase from there and always hydrate. And, you know, I'm going to teach nutrients you need to take before the sauna and nutrients you need to take after the sauna. Uh, that was yeah. an abundant answer, I think. It was, that was good. Because everybody is, everybody is a different, there's a whole different chemical makeup and we can't just prescribe one thing. And that's it for everybody, right? right. Okay. So uh, Marie, where do you find organic, good quality peanuts? I have been looking for them for a long time and I can't find any. Yeah, I don't know. I stopped using peanuts a long time ago, even though I like them. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah okay. that's maybe that's better. Yeah. There. <laughs> okay. All right. So next is Jennifer. What are common ways that plastic leach into our foods? And what is your comment on the plastic from water bottles? Should we drink that water? Right. So the common way for plastic leaching into food is physical contact. Um, so Pretty much all plastic will leach, but the harder the plastic, the less it leaches. And mm -hmm. the other factor is temperature. So the warmer the product or the warmer the contents, the more they will leach the plastic and the more acidic. So if you do, you know, tomato juice in a can, or no, let's say you do tomato juice and you're making lasagna and it's in a pan that's lined with aluminum, the acid in the tomato juice is going to increase the amount of aluminum that leaches out into the food. Yeah. So those are the key factors. For sure. Um, from Helena, what kinds of binders do you recommend? Right. Um, I like activated charcoal. Um, a lot of people are worried about it, but the evidence for activated charcoal is quite substantial. Uh, you start small and work up, but Definitely that. Uh, diatomaceous earth, which um, is ground up seashells. Uh, there is a food grade and a grade that kills bugs. The grade that kills bugs has been heated to make the ground up shells make glass shards. So mm. when people, which then damages the exoskeleton of the insects and then they dehydrate to death. So um, never ever use the insecticide version of diatomaceous earth, always food grade. It's really inexpensive, um, but it binds heavy metals, uh, pesticide residues and mycotoxins. And as it goes through the GI tract, it drags out components of biofilms and yeasts and molds and candida and stuff. And parasites too, right? Like you're saying all parasites. It, it wouldn't go after bigger ones. It would definitely change the context so that they wouldn't have the other um, flora in there that they need. Mm. So, uh, other binders, I use fulvic acid, uh, which is uh, um, shilajit, which is these kind of mineral pitch that comes from the Himalayas and a few other places. That can be expensive too, depending on where you get it, shilajit. Yeah. Very expensive. And then uh, what else do I use? I use spirulina and chlorella, although they're less binders than the other ones, but they do do some binding and have other properties. And uh, zeolites, which is yeah, ground yeah. Up, it's ground up lava with a very specific composition, um, which they, when they grind them up, the same thing with the diatomaceous earth, the pores uh, after it's ground up are the size that it allows the binding of toxins. They kind of fit in. And there's also a charge that, makes them stick. So those are my five or six. That is fascinating. Thank you. Um, Wendy's asking, what do you mean by binders? Are they fiber? Uh, no, binders aren't fiber, but fibers can be binders. So anything that binds up toxins or residues or it sticks to it um, would be considered a binder. Um, so activated charcoal is not a fiber because it's just tiny, tiny little particles. Fiber has strands, right? They're starch-like strands. So we use both of them, but uh, binders is the whole category or the whole 
overarching description. Excellent. I think that we might, does anybody have any other questions? Oh, do you recommend to take binders regularly, even not doing detoxing? I do actually. Um, but with one caveat, I try to uh, do a little while on and a little while off. Um, the big complaint that you hear about, say, activated charcoal, is that it's going to bind up your nutrients as well. And that is true, uh, which is why you know, I do the activated charcoal. So me personally, I do activated charcoal and uh, diatomaceous earth every night for a couple of weeks, and then I take a couple of days off. Um, but I do it it's kind of weird. I do my uh, liposomal C and liposomal magnesium before bed, take my melatonin, because melatonin is very good for your brain, and uh, then go to sleep. Typically, I'll wake up maybe an hour later, and then I will knock back my uh, binders. And that way, it's not interfering with any of the food nutrients. Mm, okay. And and so then I'll, yeah, so sometimes I do like five days on, two days off. And with clients, I just recommend um, we'll do like a couple months the way I just described, and then we'll look at tapering down and taking some time off. So okay. there you go. That, is that. So, that was excellent. Well, well, thank you, Paul, for the excellent talk and webinar tonight. I'm sure everybody, everybody is still on here. That's how good it was. So uh, that was like a little snapshot, everyone, of things that you're going to hear more about in Paul's Clinical Detoxification Con Ed workshop coming up on, I think it's already September 7th, right? Wednesday, September 7th. Yeah. And so if you have any questions or anything you want to contact us at the office at IHN, you know, reach out to, my name's Anna, Anna at Institute of Holistic Nutrition.com. You can reach out to any of us and we will be delighted to take your questions or enroll you into his upcoming his upcoming workshop. So thanks again, Paul, for the very interesting workshop. I love it. And uh, oh, I, I know I don't think we have any more questions that I see. Anymore. Oh, they're just saying thank you. Everybody is saying thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, everybody have a wonderful rest of your evening. I look forward to hearing from you and we'll see you all very soon. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. bye.